a warm welcome to today's webinar. Uh, it's a fascinating webinar that we've got coming up for you today, and I'm delighted to say that we've got the Novartis story, specifically looking at their communications effort around electronic invoicing. Uh, they are using Ariba as their e-invoicing solution, and I'm very pleased to say that we also have Ariba with us today. So let's get going and have a look at the amazing difference a stellar communications effort makes to your e-invoicing program, the Novartis story. So the, pres the presenters for today are the following individuals, just introducing myself. My name is Susie West. I'm the founder and CEO at sharedservicelink.com. And we also have James Tucker, who's the Director of Marketing, Network and Financial Solutions at Ariba. And Dave Martin, who's really going to be going into the detail for this presentation today. He's the Global Process Head for Requisition to Pay at Novartis. So in terms of what the agenda looks like for the next 60 minutes, please take a look at the following items. I'm going to touch briefly on the intention of this session and then hand straight over to James and Dave. And then I'll be taking your questions in the last 10 minutes of the session. So in terms of the intention of this session, um, increasingly we as a market are becoming much more aware um, of the importance of stakeholders getting it. And what do I mean by that? Um, electronic invoicing only really works when stakeholders, so that's your internal users, um, and also your suppliers get the importance of electronic invoicing. So in order to achieve this, you have to get one very key part of your e-invoicing program right. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the communications part. So historically, this is a, a part of a program that has all, always been considered fluffy. It is now seen as the critical success factor to an e-invoicing program. So really, if I can just ask you to think about how does an, a, a numbers person, because e-invoicing is typically led by finance, and the finance people are, are in finance because they're fantastic with numbers, how does a numbers person become a wordsmith and become an expert in communications? And how do they do that relatively quickly? So with that in mind, I'd now like to hand over to our, our two presenters. Um, introducing, please, James Tucker from Ariba. Over to you, James. Thanks a lot, Susie. And I thought before uh, I jumped into things that we could level set on a few key terms. And you brought up communication, and I think that's critical. Uh, but there's some other things that we'll be discussing in this webinar. So um, let's start with, of course, the obvious one is what is e-invoicing? Uh, the most common definition for e-invoicing is an electronic transmission of invoices from a supplier system to a buyer system. Um, this definition probably stems from the days of EDI, but it frequently leaves out many suppliers who don't have high volumes and can't afford or don't have the technical staff necessary for EDI. So I think a more accurate uh, definition for today for e-invoicing is that it's an electronic uh, invoice that is delivered to a buyer in an electronic form. Um, so the key p point, point there is that it's delivered to the, the buyer in electronic form. As this slide indicates, you see that um, the definition of e-invoicing supports both high volume suppliers sending structured files like EDI, XML, or C CSV uh, files like that. And also the mid to low, or, or, or what you might call the long tail suppliers, have ways of participating in electronic invoicing um, with uh, supplier portals, with a uh, uh, sending a virtual print like with PDF uh, files like that. It's, and, and even uh, paper scanning can convert uh, that pa the paper into an electronic form that can uh, be sent to the uh, buyer. Um, there's also two major classifications of e-invoice initiatives. The first is, is a buyer-driven, uh, which is what uh, Dave's going to be talking about today. And, and as such, it's called an inbound invoicing as the, the buyer sets up a program to receive electronic invoices from many of its suppliers. Um, the other definition out there is one that is uh, supplier driven, and we would call that outbound invoicing, where a supplier will send electronic invoices to many of its customers. 
Um, another concept that electronic invoicing enables is the touchless invoicing. And uh, this means that an invoice is passed or it passes a set of uh, business rules that validate the invoice uh, at the point of invoice submission. And, and along with uh, automated routing, uh, this invoice can then post directly to the buyer's ERP or AP system without a, an accounts payable professional having to touch it at all. So those are some of the concepts we're going to be discussing. Um, in terms of some trends and drivers of adoption, I wanted to just touch on a few things. Um, we've seen a dramatic shift um, to e-invoicing from paper over the past several years. And we see this um, at Ariva as uh, electronic invoicing are uh, quickly becoming the, uh, the fastest growing and the most dominant transaction in our business commerce network. Um, the opportunity for e-invoicing is still very high as there's a preponderance of uh, the 75 billion B2B global invoices uh, are still uh, paper. And so there's still an, a, a tremendous opportunity for uh, those uh, companies in the various countries, as you can see on this chart here, that are either laggards developing or still um, getting their e-invoicing initiatives going. Um, it's shifting uh, as companies continue to look for ways to drive down processing costs and suppliers are looking to improve relationships with their customers. E-invoicing presents a significant opportunity to improve business processes for both uh, buyers and suppliers. And it also represents uh, an improved means for governments to audit and improve tax collection. So we know from uh, various studies and company success stories that the business case for uh, process cost savings, for a positive working capital impact, for discount and compliance savings, uh, elevate electronic invoicing to a strategic level in the mind of uh, finance executives today. And, uh, and before I turn it over to Dave, just one more concept to, to share is that um, the finance executives, as well as IT, are looking uh, at e-invoicing using commerce networks for both process cost containment, for cash flow, as well as top-line revenue growth. In fact, uh, this uh, recent McKinsey study revealed that organizations that are using collaborative technology that connect uh, their internal efforts to customers, to suppliers, to trading partners, that they're 50% more likely to lead their market segments and achieve higher margins. Um, so Dave Martin, he's a global process head of Requisition to Pay, and he's helping Novartis become a networked enterprise with their e-link program. And so now I'll turn things over to Dave to share his experience and his insights. Dave. Thanks very much, Jim. It was a very generous introduction, so I'd like to thank you for that, and thanks to everyone on the line for taking the time to listen to our story. I do want to set the expectation very early that we're in the very early stages of this relationship with Ariba and starting our e-invoicing journey, but we have had what I think are some interesting insights about how to use communications and a communications plan to get your project started on the right foot and to keep and generate some momentum over the medium term. So we're, we're going to share that with you today. By way of introductions, again, my name is Dave Martin. I am the, the Global Process Head for rec to pay at Novartis. For those of you who are based in the U.S. or have an, an organizational culture that considers it procure to pay, from a scope perspective, we, we have the same scope. So procure to pay and requisition to pay are synonymous for us. I, I was born in Toronto and currently live in, in Basel, Switzerland. I spent about 10 years with Honeywell in a variety of roles, uh, leading rec to pay and working in the finance transformation project uh, there with Honeywell, and joined Novartis in June 2011 as the global process head for requisition to pay. Uh, you can see my smiling face there. I think getting the picture into the presentation was probably the biggest challenge. I opened up the picture, I used my little software and kept hitting the enhance button, and unfortunately it just put a black circle over my face, so I was forced to go with uh, the picture as is. As usual, I'm uh, presenting, and I have the pleasure of presenting the great work of others. So what I'm presenting to you today is really the result of a lot of uh, good thought and hard work by the Novartis project team, whom I'll introduce later, and some uh, partners, both Ariba and the company Spark now, who've helped us with our communication strategy and, and really focusing in our message. What we're going to cover today is, is a little bit about our company overview. I'll tell you and set the context of who are Novartis. What does our r to p or rec to pay landscape look like, and where are we headed with rec to pay as a whole? How did we get started on our electronic exchange journey, our, our 
e-invoicing and electronic PO transmission journey. What was the aha moment or the, the critical situation and key challenge that we had to address? What did we do to address those challenges? And what I hope you take from this webinar. So with that, Novartis's key mission and what we do every day is focus on patients. Our purpose is to care and cure, and we do provide medicines to treat and prevent diseases, ease suffering, and improve quality of life. And this is a guiding principle. It, it drives why we come to work every day, and it is relevant in requisition to pay. Even when we think about making a streamlined process for requisition to pay, a big portion of the thought is around taking uh, you know, scientists who need to order beakers and lab supplies in order to run critical experiments that are going to generate life-saving technologies and, and compounds. That's why we're in business, and that's why we're in the rec to pay business, is to make those transactions as easy as possible. From a size and scale perspective, Novartis is one of the largest companies in the world, one of the 25 largest by market cap. And we're a truly global organization. So in the bottom right corner, you can see that we do have uh, you know, sales were dominant in the US and Europe, but we really touch each and every region in the world. So not only do we have a large global portfolio, but we have a broad healthcare portfolio as well. So we, we operate a number of businesses in different market segments. We have a pharmaceuticals business, uh, an Alcon business uh, focused around eye care, uh, yeah, and vision care. We have Sando, our generics and biosimilars division, as well as a consumer health for over-the-counter and animal uh, brands, as and the vaccines and diagnostics division. I think the key takeaway there is that from a geographic and a business segment uh, perspective. We have a lot of diversity that we have to manage, different needs within all of these regions, but we want to really think, act, and focus our investment in our processes globally and standardize. So we're going to move on and talk a little bit about, uh, you know, we know who Novartis is now. What does rec to pay at Novartis look like? So I'll move to the current state. <laughs> you can see we have a fair amount of complexity. I think it's a common theme for the day. We're trying to drive common processes and standards within an, a very complex operating environment. So we, we service nine divisions, the, the kind of customer-facing divisions that I shared with you, as well as some internal uh, divisions that focus on different aspects of our process. We have 57 countries with rec-to-pay operations, 495 reporting units that we service on 226 IT backend systems primarily SAP, but different instances. We have clusters of SRM and open text to support the rec to pay process. We have the installed version of Ariba, the Ariba buyer, and Ariba invoice management. We also have Bosware, and these differences are regional and divisional, depending on where you go in the world. We have a different solution for rec to pay today. And the operations for requisition to pay are managed by each country and each division locally. A couple of fast facts so you can put this into context. We have about $16 billion in annual spend with a, a very strong bias toward indirect spend. So indirect spend accounts for about 70% of our total uh, third-party spend. And what you can see from our 20% of POs covering 80% of spend, we have a high number of POs for very low dollar values. So it's part of uh, the driver for pursuing an electronic invoicing solution, but it's also a key challenge that we have uh, smaller suppliers and a, a fragmented supply base. So we have a few suppliers with very high dollar volumes, but then a, a fragmented supplier base for a lot of uh, small numbers of transactions. We also have a low first pass yield, uh, around 20% on average at, the, at current when you look globally, which is something that we really want to drive uh, through our, our electronic network program. So our key challenge, which I think I've hopefully driven home, is managing complexity and driving common processes in this fragmented environment. So we've talked a little bit about where we are today and in the past. I think an important thing and one of the reasons that I came to work with Novartis is because we have a, what I think is a very strong vision for where we want to go with rec to pay in the future. The first things we had to do were agree on what we wanted to do. So what would be the standard processes, the controls, that we would embed into those processes, the measurements that we'd use to manage those processes, and the IT portfolio that we wanted to have in order to uh, you know, support and focus our investment in the rec to pay space. And we spent a good portion of 2011 defining what we called the requisition to pay blueprint, focusing on detailing and getting cross-divisional and global alignment for each of these components. 
now and in the future as we begin 2012. IT simplification is a cornerstone of our future. It's what's going to drive our success. So I think if you refer back to the previous slide, we had 226 IT backend systems and a whole host of uh, partners in the rec-to-pay space or technologies in the rec-to-pay space. We want to really focus in on, on the few leading technologies that we want to drive throughout the organization. So from an ERP perspective, we're consolidating. And for requisition to pay, we're going to really start to drill down and look at what's our platform, our SRM platform, and then an invoice management solution to manage the foundational elements of requisition to pay. And we've decided to partner with Ariba on the electronic exchange. So we recognize that to drive efficiency and to reduce the, the capacity for errors in the transmission processes and in our relationships with our suppliers, we've decided to go with an electronic exchange that covers everything from the purchase order transmission to our suppliers all the way through the invoicing. To move on to our invoicing portfolio, the electronic exchange is a cornerstone of our future invoicing portfolio, but of course it's, it's not, it, it's part of a suite of uh, sort of technologies that we're going to use to apply. So I just wanted to focus in on the fact that the electronic exchange is a critical part of what we want to do with our suppliers, but it's, it's not the end all and be all, and in fact it has two different phases from both a directly connected with, uh, with our high volume, high transaction suppliers, as well as uh, the, the sort of uh, PO flip and, and some more web enabled technologies that Ariba helps us to provide to those smaller suppliers, which as we saw is a, are, are a key component of our portfolio, our supplier portfolio. So hopefully now you have an appreciation for who we are as Novartis and where are we are today in our requisition to pay landscape and where we're headed in the future, let's move on to sort of the meat of this presentation. And it starts with our vision for supplier connectivity. So in 2010, we chartered a project with a clear vision that we wanted to streamline the requisition to pay process, the PO management, catalogs, invoice processing, and payment status by coming up with a supplier adoption uh, strategy and using a supplier connectivity solution, that was our terminology at the time, to deliver significant and tangible benefits. So we, we had a clear vision and we knew what we wanted to do and we kind of started to take what I would say are pretty traditional project planning steps to move forward. So you can see here that we had a you know, five step process to get to this or to achieve the vision and we took it one step further. So on our project planning uh, slide we started to think about Let's do an RFI and an RFP to find the right provider for our, uh, our supplier connectivity solution. We had a, a mantra in mind. It's, it's one face to the supplier, and it's something that we really are trying to simplify and streamline the business processes from an external point of view, so how our suppliers interact with Novartis, as well as from an internal point of view, we have a one face to the customer mantra. So we want to make sure that if I'm executing a business process from within uh, from within Novartis that I have a similar look and feel, a similar conduit to enable that business process. So we, we really wanted to try for a single global partner in the supplier connectivity space. And as a result, we decided to select Ariba after going through a, a rigorous RFI and RFP process. Key reasons were really, the key reason was their uh, supplier coverage, the coverage of our supply base globally, as well as their geographic coverage. So it matched our footprint probably better than uh, any of the other suppliers, and that's why we chose to partner up with Ariba. And of course, once we had a supplier selected, a clear vision, we started to put a wish list together for our pipeline. And as you can see, which is something that's maybe a little bit unique uh, to the Novartis story, is that we, we have a version of the solution in place. Uh, we have a, a, an electronic invoicing solution with Ariba in place in the U.S. So our focus was largely on trying to penetrate Europe as quickly as possible. And as you saw earlier in the presentation, Europe represents a significant proportion of our sales and also of our spend and therefore our invoicing. Uh, and that presents some challenges and also some opportunities because Europe is a more challenging uh, operating environment for electronic invoices than uh, the US where there's a little bit more liberalization and a little bit uh, sort of more maturity in the electronic invoicing space. So armed with kind of the traditional project planning stuff, we put our project team together. And I do want to acknowledge the amazing work of our, our project team. So it's led by uh, 
some of our top talent, and I think that's an important message even as we start into communicating. One of the ways that you can signal your intent to support a project or the level of priority of a project is to put top talent on a project, and so we clearly focused on doing that. I think one of the things that we're very proud of in terms of how we set up the, the program as a whole is that we focused on being cross-functional, so making sure at every level in the, the program we have sourcing, finance, and IT represented, as well as being cross-regional. So we wanted to import some of the knowledge uh, from the U.S. team who've had experience and success working with electronic exchange or supplier connectivity. But we also wanted to make sure that we were representing the European perspective as well. So largely by uh, taking some team members from our Swiss team who tend to come from all, all over the world, as, as I myself am sort of an example of. Uh, but we wanted to make sure we represented both the, the U.S. and the European perspective on the program and the project team. We also made sure to tie out with not only our kind of global uh, program team, but with our general governance for all of our other core um, core rec to pay processes, service providers, and IT infrastructure. So we had the who, the what, and the, the how kind of documented, and we, we felt very good about that. And I think we, sh we did a good job up to that point of really focusing in on Okay, we have a mandate, we have a vision, now we're going to go execute and we put the right uh, pieces into place for that. So we went out to engage our countries and to start to sign up those, those European countries that we wanted to bring on board and, and our pilot countries as well. And as we went out and started to have discussions with the senior leaders within each of our country organizations, we had some unexpected feedback. And I think three key messages were that they didn't really understand the benefits. We weren't able as a program team and a project team to clearly articulate all of the benefits. We really had a focus on the typical business case benefits of, of cost avoidance. But the cost avoidance really was kind of limited to one group, our finance group, who realized the majority of those benefits, and other groups whom we needed to enroll, our, our sourcing teams and our IT teams, didn't see the direct value of those benefits. There's obviously always a resource crunch. Any, any resource assigned to support a given project is uh, not doing probably a whole host of other very valuable things. And there was a concern that perhaps this is oh, just another global project, that it's, it's kind of the flavor of the week, but it's not here to stay necessarily. And as you can see from our fragmented landscape, we've had in the past some uh, aborted attempts to, to try to drive standards and, and where we've kind of taken it 50% of the way, but then moved on to the next phase very quickly. So there was a little bit of hesitation from our country leaders. We had this aha moment. <laughs> we focused on the who, the when, and the how, but our stakeholders, the people we needed to en enroll both inside the company and outside, didn't really care about the who, when, and how until we'd made them care about the why. So that was our, our first aha moment. The second was that Stakeholders, especially the cross-requisition to pay, and, and specifically in the context of a supplier connectivity or an electronic exchange program, come from a whole host of backgrounds that have different values. They value different portions of what the supplier connectivity can bring to the table. And even within the project team, the IT project team members might articulate a different set of benefits from the sourcing project team members, from the finance project team members. So we, we were maybe sending the wrong messages to the wrong people at the wrong times. Stakeholders also need to believe not only that this initiative is kind of hot and off the press today, but that it's going to continue and be sustainable for the future. So we, we had these, these brilliant insights, or these insights which maybe we should have had earlier, but we realized we have a few key challenges that we really need to focus on. Uh, so we focused on three things. How do we build buy-in and enthusiasm for the program? How do we compete for priority resources and funding? And how do we build on some early successes, which I, we're all confident we will have, and maintain the momentum as we start to move from a, a nascent or a pilot program into an operating program? So having realized the challenges, we had to figure out how to address them. And we, we realized that if we didn't address these programs, these key challenges, our program would either very much slow down or potentially even stop if we couldn't build engagement from our country organizations. And it's, uh, it was imperative 
that we addressed those challenges right away. So we really tried to focus on a few key actions that would help us to address the, the build uh, buy-in and enthusiasm challenge by creating an identity, so shaping perception, creating an internal look and feel that people were comfortable with, that they could latch on to, arming every project team member with an elevator pitch so that we would articulate the right benefits and consistently articulate the benefits from everybody's perspectives, competing for priority resources and funding required us to get the right messages to the right stakeholders at the right time so that when we asked for resource allocation from the countries or from budget from executive leaders. We were delivering the right set of benefits to compel them to, to want to support the program. And we created relevance with a narrative, and it's something that we'll focus on in a little bit, but I think it's a, a, a unique way to bring people and engage them in the process and not have it be a, a set of facts on a page, but really a story that they can latch on to. And in terms of building on early successes and maintaining momentum, we put some structural changes into place in, in terms of policy process and contract uh, language. And we recognize that this isn't a static activity, that you know, as your project and program mature, your communications approach has to evolve, and it has to become stronger and address the challenges of the stage, the life cycle stage in the program that you're at. So without much further ado, let's take a little bit of a look at uh, what we actually did. And this is sort of the beginning of talking to you about the package of, of communications materials that we put together for the program team and armed the project teams with to go out and get this program off the ground. First was to create a look and feel. So we wanted to create a, a name, an internal uh, name that we could use for the program, and a tagline so that people understood what, what was it we were talking about. And we've chosen eLink paperless supplier connectivity. We chose eLink because it aligns with our eShop program, which is our overall requisition to pay um, internal branding. It reinforces the value of creating strong bonds with our suppliers. So it's really the, we're not pursuing this as a cost saving opportunity. It's really a way to get closer to our suppliers and to, to forge, you know, to remove one barrier from our uh, our relationship with the supplier. And we chose to embellish that with paperless supplier connectivity because it's, it clarifies who we're linking. So eLink could link any two things, but we're linking ourselves to our suppliers. And it speaks to the shared values of pursuing green solutions. So we're really focusing on the paperless uh, aspect of the, the program because it is something that's important. It also preserved the original project identity, which was the supplier connectivity, and make sure that from an executive perspective, they don't feel that you're taking a 180 degree turn from where you started. We're really embellishing uh, on where we began the program. So armed now with a, a logo and a brand name, eLink Paperless Supplier Connectivity, we decided we, you know, it's, it's not enough to just have that. We need to make sure that we can arm the project team with an elevator pitch to shape leadership's understanding of the program, whether it's at a corporate level or in the countries, and provide a simple, concise message. So as you can see, you could read the entire sentence for each check mark in our, our uh, elevator pitch, but everybody on the program team can articulate the, the highlighted messages very quickly. So if I have 10 seconds to explain what eLink is, I can say it saves money, reduces errors, generates on-time invoice payment, is a strategic initiative, and demonstrates a green commitment. That's our, uh, that's our elevator pitch. It's the first thing. It's what opens the door to have further communication with any executive uh, leader in our company about this eLink program. So the target's really the leadership, and it's, it's to open that door and to start, us, start the conversation in more uh, detail and to, to be able to then go into, go into the specifics of the program and start to articulate the key benefits to the exact leader that you're talking to. We also needed to provide some reasons to believe, because as we mentioned, one of the uh, challenges was that, OK, this is great, and it's, it's hot off the presses now. It's something that you're focused on. But how do we know that this is something that you're going to drive for the long term? So again, we armed a few key messages, our project team with a few key messages. E-Link's vital. It has top management backing, both at headquarters in Basel as well as in the country. We don't want to fall behind our peer groups. We're not trying to implement some brand new technology that's unproven. 
And in fact, we've already proven that we can implement this technology. We have a version of the solution already up and running successfully in the US. So hopefully those are some compelling reasons to believe that we're going to do this and do it well in the long term. So the next component of our, our package for the project team is really a what I would call a messaging chart or a, a message board to drive, you know, high level messages open the door, but they don't convince an individual stakeholder to sign up their resources, to offer you their people, to share their budget. In order to do that, they we need to make sure that we drive the right messages to the right people as we're speaking with them. So we armed the program team with with some pretty detailed level messages. Some examples are up on the, on the screen for you right now. So for example, if we're speaking with uh, a country manager, we talk about the low cost of processing the invoices because of course they have P&L responsibility. We talk a little bit about uh, compliance because they typically have uh, the, the final signing authority for representation letters for Sarbanes-Oxley. So keeping them out of jail is always a compelling reason to uh, to sign up to something. And also the the three-way match, the seamless three-way match, the reduction of errors, the lowering of costs, but also the lowering of noise from suppliers. So the increased supplier satisfaction because Oftentimes, that if things escalate, then country management needs to get involved. So that's just an example of a few key messages targeted to that uh, leader. Whereas we wouldn't probably talk to them a lot about, uh, you know, reducing the number of invoicing queries, so calls and emails that come in as a result of uh, in, incorrect matching of invoices, because the, their their level of enthusiasm for caring about that specific message is not as important as it is, say, to the manager of accounts payable for that country or for the manager of requisition to pay for that country. Hopefully that gives you a sense of how the, the uh, message chart helps us to give the project team the ability to get the right message to the right person at the right time. And next I, I talked a little bit about the, the narrative technique. So we found that people typically access the requisition to pay process from a very specific vantage point. If they were a requisitioner of goods and services at some point, then they always thought about the requisition to pay uh, story from that perspective. They saw that, yeah, I ordered something and then I got some calls. And they, they view it from a very kind of them-centric uh, vantage point. We needed to engage them in the invoices story. So put the invoice at the center of the story and really let them understand all the different touch points and why there's complexity and, and challenges in the process today without uh, the e-link solution and what the e-link solution could do to really help them to change the story and have a very different feel. So if, without further ado, I'll walk you through the story of the rogue invoice. And the story of the rogue invoice starts with Rob. Rob's the owner of a company, the marketing company. He likes to cook, and he sends an invoice to Novartis on September the 5th. The invoice makes its way to Novartis, where Mary's sitting. And Mary's the AP clerk who happens to love salsa dancing. She gets a call from Rob about a missing payment and realizes, I, I never got that invoice that somehow made its way to Novartis, asks Rob to send it again. So Rob sends a second copy of the invoice, and it's now the 25th of November, and Mary says, oh, no, there's no purchase order number on this invoice. I'd better get to Rob again. So she calls Rob and tells him there's no purchase order number, which you need. So now we get a new stakeholder in the process, and it's John. So John's a big football fan who works for marketing at Novartis, um, and he requisitioned the goods from Rob. Rob calls him and says, hey, uh, I need a purchase order number because I talked to your AP department and they said, nope, no purchase order, I can't pay the invoice. So Rob uh, prints the invoice now with the purchase order number on December 1st, about two months after he sent it in, or three months after he sent it in, and he sends it again to accounts payable. And Mary, who's uh, heard from Rob twice now and seen this invoice cross her desk a couple of times, gets the invoice and looks at it and tries to post it posts it and blocks it and says, oh no, now there's no goods received in there. And so she's got to go back to John, which she does, and asks him to get the missing info. John is on vacation for the entire month of December, shows up on January the 3rd and says, oh yeah, well, no problem, and punches in the goods receipt. And on the 15th of January, the following year, almost five months after the initial invoice was sent, Rob gets his payment. and for some reason unbeknownst to us and everyone in the process, he's not happy about that. So at the end of the day, 
Rob, the supplier, is feeling irritated and hassled. He didn't get what he wanted. He thinks dealing with Novartis is very difficult. John is just annoyed by the bureaucracy. You know, why do I have to do all this stuff and this requisition of paper? So I just wanted to get something, and uh, you know, I assume you guys have to pay the invoice, but I don't really care how you do that. And Mary, the AP clerk, had to spend a ton of time sorting things out for people, and, and, and from her vantage point, is really just trying her best to help everybody to get this invoice paid, but ends up bearing the brunt of a lot of frustration from both sides. But it could be very different. So if we take the, the concept of a smart invoice or an invoice that's uh, processed through our e-link system, so next time Rob fortunately decides to do business with us one more time, and in March he sends another invoice along our e-link supplier connect paperless supplier connectivity solution, and he submits it. Mary, who's sitting at her desk, relaxed because she doesn't have all these issues, is working on other things and doesn't ever see Rob's invoice. In the background, it's being approved for payment through the e-link system. Rob goes online to check the status of the invoice. On the 19th of April, exactly when the terms are due, he sees it's due for payment, and the payment comes on time. John, who was in our previous story, having to deal with this uh, requisition of pay process when he should have been out there trying to you know, focus on his marketing priorities and his goals and objectives for the year, is nowhere in the story. He requisitioned the goods, received them, and doesn't have to do any of uh, the touching that he had to do in the past. So his, for, from his perspective, the process is seamless and working behind the scenes. So as a result, for our, our countries, you know, we get accurate information about costs incurred and invoices paid. It, there's transparency throughout the process. Stronger supplier relationships and success stories. So when they come in for negotiation or renegotiation for the next round of service, it's uh, you know they're not adding a secret uh, margin increase for uh, the the difficulty of dealing with the requisition to pay process. And there's more time to spend on important things with more value added for the business. So from an AP uh, department perspective, rather than having to spend time focusing on either invoice entry or error resolution, the AP team can really focus on uh, mining data, creating good information, and arming the, the business with the information they need in order to make strategic business decisions. So that's our rogue invoice story, which we deliver in person to the countries when we go in to talk to them about, uh, about the e-link program and what it would mean for them. So it's good to have kind of a, a communication package, a deck that we can take, and some targeted messages. But we also have to provide a signal that we are going to you know, demonstrate the leadership commitment at the headquarters level, the corporate level, by making some important structural changes, right? Some things that signal that this is an important program, it's here to stay, and it's, you know, that bolster the success of the program over the long term. So we really tried to focus on a few key things in, in both policy and process, as well as in our uh, negotiations and third-party contracts. So from a policy and process perspective, we did a few things. We, we established e-link as the primary mode of transacting in the rec to pay blueprint. So we talked about the requisition to pay blueprint. We built some of the alignment and the buy-in from the divisions at that level. And we made sure that, uh, you know, as we were speaking about what is the ideal requisition of pay process, we included the e-link process. We also updated purchasing policy to mandate that if we have a supplier who's using e-link with us, who's on our e-link system, you can't, you know, pick an alternative. There's no option other than using e-link, uh, whether it's using the supplier's preferred system or whether it's uh, you know, oh, just this time, send me a paper invoice and we'll do something else. So the purchasing policy and the guidelines clearly state that e-link is the preferred mode of communication with our suppliers. And we, we selected e-link as an enterprise asset in our IT portfolio. That means that this is the one and only solution from an uh, electronic connection, electronic invoicing solution perspective and prevents the implementation of any alternatives. So it doesn't allow a country to go rogue and come up with their own their own electronic invoicing preferred solution. And then we also looked at our third party contracting. So we worked with the buyers and category managers to make sure that the e-link is top of mind and that it's included in every negotiation and renewal. So it's a discussion point in every negotiation for a new contract or renewal of an existing relationship and contract. We armed them with some standard language that fixes the electronic PO and invoice exchange as part of the standard conditions in our uh, in our uh, standard contract. 
And we used E-Link's increased payment, payment timeliness as, uh, and transparency as a lever in the negotiation. So the, the buyers and the category managers actually uh, you know, use that to, to help share some of the value that we can create along with our suppliers and hopefully lower uh, shorten payment terms as well as lower costs from our suppliers. We also have, uh, you know, Novartis' CPO, the Chief Procurement Officer, is endorsing the e-link process by sending an email to the suppliers, telling them how important it is, but also in supplier forums, which happen regularly, really driving home the message that this is how we want to work with our suppliers and that it, it shares, that there's shared value for both us and the supplier in going with e-link. So as we move forward, it's it's great to have this package and, and it's really focused around helping us to ramp up and build engagement and fill our pipeline and start doing implementation processes. We've armed our, program, our project and program team with the, the look and feel, the elevator pitch, a detailed message plan, the rogue invoice story, and some, some support for policies, processes, and third-party contracting. But it's not communication messages aren't static. So we're going to continue to work by putting some good uh, rigor around continuing to think about communication and acknowledging that it changes over time as your program matures. So we have a project closure toll gate for every implementation that we're going to run that includes a full messaging debrief for the, for the project. So we talk about you know what worked, where did the message kind of hit home, and help us to you know, get engagement or get to suppliers or internal stakeholders really excited about the project, and where did it miss, and what do we need to change in order to make sure that each of our messages are hitting home. Uh, so we'll continue to update our, our message plan as we go forward. Project managers and the team are actively collecting real life in examples to enhance the narrative. So I think you know, as we move forward, it's great to have a generic rogue invoice story, and it's a nice way to start the communication, but the more that we go through and kind of collect real life examples of the rogue invoice story. And we know there are lots, even though this one happens to be a generic story. It helps to cement the before and after in Novartis culture and in the Novartis uh, environment. So I think as we start to do our implementations, we'll in, in enhance the rogue invoice story with a real life before and after example rather than a kind of generic before and after example. We have a message tune-up session planned for the third quarter of this year, so we know we have a defined date when we'll sit down for a half a day and just reevaluate what do we need to, you know, what's working and what do we need to change from a messaging perspective. And we continue to work with our stakeholders uh, throughout both internal and external to the company to capture their input and understand their needs and their values and how they're responding to the, the program as a whole, but also to the messaging. So it's, I think, important to make sure that you know communication is a mindset. It's not just a set of, uh, you know, a set of documents or a set of actions that you take once and and forget about it. It's really, you know, bringing to the team's uh, awareness that building buy-in, having people, all stakeholders from different perspectives understand the why, is one of the keys to success. talk a little bit about the road ahead. So what are we doing with all of this wonderful documentation we've uh, built up? We're, we're building our pipeline or our roadmap. We're filling our pipeline by getting uh, commitments for project timelines and definite dates and definite resources for this year and next year. So we're building up executive support using the elevator pitch. We're using dynamic communication to build enthusiasm within the countries. We're testing the complete model, the full package with our pilot country. We're propagating the look and feel amongst all of the requisition to pay documents, and we have some newsletters that we send out, uh, some email communication, a few, a few avenues to make sure the e-link becomes sort of part of the landscape and the, the background of requisition to pay. And we're arming the project team with this set of tools to deliver their project differently. We're really putting a focus not just on execution of the project deliverables, but on the building, you know, communicating and building engagement and buy it. We've had some very positive results so far, so I, I mentioned right up front that we're still very early in our implementation program, so I can't tell you it's, uh, you know, this was the one key and it's fixed everything and we've implemented 100 countries, but we've had very good response from our pilot country uh, after our kickoff meetings and now actually uh, not just a kickoff meeting, but we've started our implementation work. 
and we've actually started to get inquiries from country leaders that we haven't approached based on word of mouth. So either you know through their you know they talked to a counterpart in another country who'd heard about uh, eLink, and now they're excited. And and so I think we're we're obviously sending some of the right messages, and not only that, we're sending them in a way that they're clear and concise and can be transmitted without us being anywhere in the process from you know one stakeholder in our company to another. And I think that that tells us we're on the right track. So let me quickly just give you a summary and, and what I hope you take away from the, the presentation. The amazing difference that a stellar communication effort can make to your invoicing program, well, it can build enthusiasm and engagement with stakeholders. It can capture a share of mind from your leadership. It can challenge the project team to work differently. It can deliver the right messages to the right audiences at the right time. And it, it has to change and develop as your project and program mature. So with that, I'd like to make sure that you understand it drives and sustains project success. Without proper communication, without thinking about building this engagement, making everyone understand the why is very difficult to get a program off the ground and to keep it running and, and maintain that enthusiasm and momentum over the long term. So with that, I'd like to turn it back to James for some wrap-up. Well, that's fantastic, Dave. Uh, I really appreciate the vision that you guys laid out for your uh, program, uh, streamlining your R2P process and focusing on supplier adoption uh, strategy and connectivity. I think that is key. And as Susie said in the in, at the onset, one of the things that's op often overlooked in, pro in projects like this. I also really liked your uh, rogue invoice and how your sort of story evolved the rogue invoice into the smart invoice. Um, and certainly appreciate uh, explaining to our audience here why why you selected Ariba. Uh, one of which was uh, because of our uh, global uh, footprint, global coverage, as well as the supplier coverage. So I thought just to wrap up before we get into Q and A, um, for those of you that are less familiar with Ariba, I could uh, just give you a brief introduction of our growing company, our in our solutions. Um, you know, Ariba has been uh, doing this and been in the business commerce business for over a dozen years. Um, we provide uh, B2B commerce solutions over uh, the world's largest uh, business commerce network. We have the expertise, and resources, and the services that you need for buying, for selling, and for managing cash. Uh, last year, we added Quadrum and B Process to the Ariba family. A Quadrum adds expertise. Uh, to the Southern Hemisphere, and B Process brings over 11 years of experience and leadership in the e-invoicing market of France and across Europe. Uh, combined, the Ariba network now processes over 60 million invoices, uh, just shy of $300 billion of spend, with nearly a million global trading partners uh, in, in this now uh, larger Ariba network. Um, B Process adds uh, 130 experts that are dedicated to Ariba's electronic invoicing business. And of course, they have uh, numerous uh, customers, including uh, Eurocopter, L'Oreal, Total, Carrefour, many others uh, that they have uh, success with across Europe. And they also bring uh, additional expertise into local VAT requirements. And this adds some very cool features to uh, Ariba's invoice management suite. So let me just talk through this quickly. We don't have time to go through the details of this slide. Uh, you can get copies of these slides, and some of these features are, are somewhat self-explanatory. Um, uh, but the capabilities that I, I did want to uh, emphasize here are kind of, again, going back to what Susie and Dave were both talking about, that um, the community of your uh, suppliers is an, an integral part uh, to the success of your program. So ensuring that um, uh, you, you understand that what suppliers that you're doing business with are already uh, participating in a network like this, that can really help jumpstart your program. What are the uh, countries that are being exchanged, the currencies, the supported languages? Those kinds of things become important. Um, I'll, I'll go on to the next slide and kind of get into how Ariba uh, is helping companies comply with uh, Europe's e-invoicing directive. <clears throat> the um, the ability to support these common tax methods, things like that, or GST, PST, other withholding taxes, it's vital to making this global e-invoicing initiative uh, successful. 
Ariba, um, through our organization, uh, we're processing invoices in over 140 different countries. We have, have transactions in more than 70 different currencies. And to uh, expedite a global e-invoicing rollout, uh, we allow you to configure up to 40 business rules at the country level and apply them to e-invoice templates. And this helps you define the e-invoice requirements by country. As you can see on this chart, um, we're compliant in 35 countries around the world. And if you will focus in on, uh, on the, the circle there, and that uh, gets us a bit more into the countries where we're compliant in Europe. Um, of the 35, 23 of those are countries in Europe. And uh, we uh, have a, um, what we call a country guide. And we provide a country guide to our uh, buyers and to the sellers that provides them guidance uh, that's uh, written and signed off by KPMG that says these are the things that you must do in order to be compliant. Uh, talked briefly about it on a previous slide that um, in terms of uh, digital signature, in terms of archival, that kind of functionality, uh, the specific tax rates, where you need to store your uh, paper invoices, uh, et cetera. And all of that's written up in a, a country guide that is useful for managing your program. But we also have it built into our application. So it's configured into our system on a country-by-country -country basis, whether you're the sender or the receiver. Um, so that's a quick introduction. Uh, we're short on time, and we want to get into Q&A. But before we jump into Q&A, I want to encourage you to uh, leverage uh, Ariba's expertise. Uh, we're available to help you in creating a strong business case. And many of the things that Dave spoke about uh, for organizing, creating communications, et cetera, for your e-invoicing program. And there's also a link here for you to download a global e-invoicing and compliance data sheet. And uh, that will help you uh, better understand some of the functionality that I didn't have time to get into on this call. Also, um, if you want to be able to uh, network with uh, your peers who are already doing these programs, both on the buy side as well as the sell side. I highly encourage you to participate at Ariba Live. We'll have about 3,000 people attending uh, across Las Vegas and Barcelona. You can see the dates here. There's a link for you to take a look at some of the, uh, the awesome lineup that we have for this year's event. Uh, so with that, Susie, I'll turn things over to you for, uh, for Q&A. Thank you very much to Dave and James. Uh, that was great. If you have some questions, which I'm sure you do, please do use the free text uh, box in your GoToWebinar panel to submit those questions through to me now. Uh, but we already have uh, a number of questions, and we have about four minutes for questions. So um, let's kick off with one question, which I'll direct to Dave, please. So question on your rogue invoice story, very, very comprehensive way of explaining this and explaining the importance of e-invoicing to the organization. How The question is, how did you actually present the story to the relevant stakeholders? So what we do is it's part of our deck for live presentation. So when we open the door with the elevator pitch that can be delivered either in person or by email, but once we actually meet with the country, whether it's online or in person, that's when we facilitate and deliver the invoice, uh, the rogue invoice story, very similarly to the way I delivered it today. So was this in a um, kind of a workshop environment? Was it in a uh, maybe a, a conference environment? Was it on a one-to-one? -one? How, how did you actually get the story in front of it, and in front of the right stakeholders? And, and perhaps did you do webinars as well? Absolutely. And webinar and internal webinars is a big part of what we do. So typically we'll meet with, let's say we want to enroll Spain and have them sign up to, to give us resources and to, to be enthusiastic about deploying the e-invoice solution or the e-link solution. Then we would meet with probably the sourcing head, the country leader, the CFO from the Spain team, and we'd present all of the communications and talk to them a little bit about the benefits, tailor it specifically to them. And one of the things we'd share would be the, the rogue invoice story. And if it's uh, possible, then we do it in person. That's always preferred. But if it's not possible, then we do it uh, virtually. Thank you. Um, another question, please, through to you, Dave. Um, I suppose, in a way, following on from that, say Spain, for example, how did you determine who the stakeholders should be that you should be getting in front of? Was it 
were you kind of um, job title specific in your approach or prescriptive in your approach? Did you shoot out a communication saying that you're beginning to start this project? If you have an interest in it, please come to us. How did you actually identify who the stakeholders were? Good. So let me take that in two parts. One is in terms of how do we determine which countries. I think partially it's a preference by volume, so we want to capture as much volume as possible. That's how we kind of target countries, but it's also they need to enroll. They need to be part of, they, they have to want to be a part of the, the solution and to work with us on, on a specific timeline. But in terms of identifying all the stakeholders to the, the process, we actually started very small. We, we thought we just needed to talk to the finance head for the, the division. And what we found, or for the region or the country, and what we found is that as we started to talk with the finance head, then they would say, oh yeah, but I really need to talk to the sourcing head. And the sourcing head would do, yeah, but I need to think about from my supplier perspective. And, and that's how we really built up our portfolio of suppliers. It started from you know thinking about our, our stakeholders in a very kind of linear, straightforward way by job title. And what we discovered as part of our aha moment was there are a broad number of stakeholders, and they all have an influence over the success or failure of uh, the adoption of a, this e-link program. So that's how we sort of started to build out. You started. Our and and would it would it be fair to say then, when you identified a key key person within a country, that a key question that you asked them is who else should be educated on this program as well? Absolutely, and I think as we've matured now, and as we've done some thinking about it, we've started to go in with a much uh, broader list of stakeholders and to recommend, shouldn't we involve this, the sourcing head? Shouldn't we involve uh, maybe a supplier panel? Shouldn't we involve the country leader or a representative from the requisitioning team? So we've started to become more, uh, you know, some, have some more insight into that. But we also always ask if there are any additional parties that need to be invited. And along the way, when you've been asking for these, is there anyone in, in particular that should, we should be reaching out to? Have you had any surprises? Some a job title, perhaps, or an individual that's been presented to you that you perhaps wouldn't have thought of initially? I think when we started, we actually, um, with our pilot country, when we were engaging them and, and compelling them to be our pilot country, they had us interview a small group of kind of key requisitions and they were actually assistants to senior executives as well as um, some representatives from uh, the lab equipment buying team and that was something we hadn't con considered inviting them to participate in the session or, or really thinking of them in a distinct way as stakeholders but we that was a, I guess an aha moment for us as well or a surprise. Mm -hmm. Okay and also obviously you've got the CPO behind this and this is something that um, a lot of the people on, on this webinar will be obviously well impressed by, but realize that this is something that they must do themselves if the, if, um, the, the, the invoicing project is going to be a success. Is there one thing that you did that really hooked in the, the engagement of the CPO? I think so, and I think it was focusing the message on the building of, or the enhancing supplier relationships and the fact that E-Link could really drive value in supplier negotiation, contract negotiation, help us to achieve better payment terms and lower negotiated rates, as well as uh, reduce the amount of noise in the supplier community when uh, interacting with buy, his, the, the CPO's buyers and commodity managers or category managers. So I think that was really the key message, so focusing on the right messages rather than a a cost-saving transactional efficiency message which resonated with the CFO. Okay, there are so many more questions to ask, um, but I'm just going to 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 wrap this this Q and A session up with with one final one, if I may. Um, and and David, it's coming back to you if that's okay. Um, how are you finding that suppliers are actually responding to this program? Suppliers have actually been, they've given us some interesting insights uh, that we're now using as we go out to do our supplier adoption. It, it, and, and those things were really not to treat your suppliers if this is the only time you ever, so not to send out maybe a threatening note or a, 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 a telling them it's a mandate and they must comply, but rather sharing with them the idea of the benefit. So when one of our stakeholders in our dynamic messaging plan is the supplier, and in our supplier invitation letter to join the e-link program, there's a good section that focuses in, in in a very similar way to the elevator pitch on what are the key messages from a supplier perspective. How is this going to drive value for you? And those messages have actually hit home, and, and instead of being a, 
a push from Novartis to the suppliers. It's become a pull from suppliers. I actually got a call from uh, the contract manager for a, a very big multinational supplier of ours who said, how quickly, you know, when are you rolling this out in this country because we can't wait to get on. So there's, there really is a, now a pull from suppliers by focusing in on how does this create value for them rather oh, than great. the mandate is complied. That's great. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. And it's, it's very positive to hear that, that feedback. So um, uh, Dave Martin, thank you very much indeed. And of course, James Tucker, thank you very much indeed for your input too. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, just like to draw your attention to the webinar that we've got next week. Please do come and join us. It's um, looking at making spreadsheet kung fu an act of the past. So join us for that um, very engaging webinar and also just like to point out we've got uh, three conferences coming up that's taking us up to the end of May. Very pleased to say that Ariba is joining us at the European Summit for Leaders in Financial Services and also at the Procure to Pay Leader Summit in Chicago. That's it from me today. Look forward to welcoming you next time at shared